Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest podcast. And what I'm going to be doing the next couple weeks, or maybe next couple months, is actually looking at some of the uh, material we presented at RSNA 2010, and we have some excellent exhibits, and they really are the basis for some really good talks, I have to say so myself. And here's a... Uh, I will start with cardiac tumors, 3D visualization, and looking at patterns of disease. And this was an excellent exhibit, and it's being submitted, and hopefully you'll be reading it in press soon by Linda Chu, who's one of our excellent residents. And in this exhibit and in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the appearances of the primary benign and malignant cardiac tumors. And although they're rare, remember with CTA being so popular, we are picking these up more frequently, sometimes incidentally, but we're often referred patients to evaluate for suspected masses. We're going to review the CT appearance of metastatic disease based on the patterns of entry into the heart. And again, with patients getting better chemotherapy, patients are living longer, and their patterns of disease spread are changing in cardiac metastasis, either by direct invasion from the uh, SVC or IVC or pulmonary veins or pulmonary arteries are definitely changing. And we're going to look at some of the things that can simulate the so-called pseudo-lesions and look at some differential diagnosis based on location and specific CT findings. So let's get started. We all know cardiac tumors are rare. The prevalence is, you know, somewhere between 0.001 to 0.3%, and probably it's somewhere in between those numbers. The majority, about 75% of primary cardiac tumors are benign, and metastases to the heart occur about 20 to 40 times more frequently than primary cardiac tumors. And a lot of this, of course, uh, in terms of numbers, is based on uh, pathology. Uh, prior to fast CT or MR, you really didn't pick up these metastases. But again, it's much more common to have metastatic disease than primary tumors. Now, CT was never a big uh, application for cardiac tumors because we didn't scan fast enough. But with the uh, newest MDCT scanners with 64 and beyond, when we have a high spatial and high temporal resolution, particularly with gated imaging, it's really ideal. And it's become more common. It's often an incidental pickup, but it can be a critical pickup. So things we're going to look at, we're going to look at the role of cardiac CT in evaluation of tumors, and we'll focus on some specific things that tend to uh, really help you in differential diagnosis. We'll look at location, we'll look at extent, we'll look at size, and other specific characteristics which help narrow down the differential diagnosis. So the first thing, of course, you're going to look at, is there a cardiac mass present? And there is a mass present, where is it located? Is it within one of the chambers specifically? Is it extending along the great vessels and growing into the heart? Is it in the pericardium? Is it a valvular process? And what about its tissue type? Is it fat? Does it have calcifications? Is there any relevant clinical history? So for example, a patient with renal cell carcinoma, a patient with lung cancer, a patient with melanoma, those all may be very, very critical histories. Okay, is there a cardiac mass? And here's just, just two examples. Image on your left, it's a true mass, right? It's well-defined, it's within the cardiac chamber. If you got delayed scans, the mass persists. And by the way, when we talk about it, and you talk about a lesion in this location, you can think about metastasis, you also can think about angiosarcoma. You wanna be particularly careful in the patient's right atrium because of fast injections and flow-related changes we often see artifacts in the superior vena cava, and those artifacts track down into the right atrium. You often get these pseudo lesions. Now, sometimes it's really hard. Often the coronal view will make it more obvious, but sometimes you're just not certain. Is this really flow related, or is it a clot, or is it a tumor? Again, the easiest thing to do is delayed phase imaging. Uh, there's no doubt some of the artifacts related to motion uh, are eliminated when you gate the study, but flow becomes a very important source of artifacts. So one rule we typically have, if you're thinking about a tumor and it's in the right atrium and there's so much artifact and turbulence with the contrast is really dense, as in the case I'm showing you here in the SVC, you really need to get delayed scans. You just do not want to send someone to surgery based on those images. Okay. So let's talk about intracavitary masses. Well, what's a differential diagnosis? Well, of course, one thing is thrombus. We see thrombus probably most commonly because of patients having catheters in place. Remember, it's easy to get a thrombus at the end of a central line, particularly with patients having catheters more commonly and the catheter staying ever longer. This is definitely a possibility. 
we can think about primary benign tumors, myxoma, lipoma, rhabdomyoma, fibromas. Those are all possibilities. We can think of primary malignant tumors, angiosarcomas, other possible sarcomas, uh, leiomyosarcomas, for example. We can think about lymphoma. And we also could think about metastatic disease. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. What about thrombus? Well, it's truthfully the most common cardiac mass. It typically is a hypodense filling defect within any of the chambers. They're probably most commonly in the right atrium and then maybe left atrium. Um, there's no enhancement. Remember, with myxomas, we often talk about delayed enhancement. There is no enhancement in thrombus. There are predisposing risk factors myocardial infarction with scar aneurysm, so you'll see thrombus in the left ventricle, patients with arrhythmias, patients with indwelling catheters, as I mentioned, particularly in the right atrium, patients with valvular disease, patients with hypercoagulability states. Now, some examples. Here are two patients with left ventricular infarcts with mural thrombus. Now, it's a very, very classic location in the tip of the left ventricle. And of course, the image on your left, you very nicely see the calcification present, which makes it very simple. Here's a nice example of where you see the catheter extending into the right atrium and the thrombus adherent to the catheter. Again, you can see it very nicely. You would suspect it from the axial images. When you do those coronal or sagittal images, it becomes even more obvious. Or here's a patient with thrombus in the IVC, right ventricle and left ventricle due to an underlying uh, condition, antiphospholipid syndrome. So sometimes we see lots of areas of thrombus. Sometimes we see areas of thrombus and areas of infarct. So if you see something in one of the chambers of the heart and then you look at the spleen or kidneys and you see infarcts, it even makes it more certain. What else? Myxomas. Myxomas are the most common benign tumor of the heart. They account for up to half of primary cardiac tumors. The majority, about 80%, are in the left atrium, about 10 to 15% are in the right atrium, and there are rare cases in the ventricles. Mean diagnosis is age 50, with females more common than males, and the presentation is very variable. Patients can be asymptomatic. It may be an incidental finding on a chest CT where we see a mass in the left atrium, for example, often with calcification. It can present with mitral valve obstruction. Systemic embolization is another not uncommon presentation. Patients can have constitutional symptoms. Again, um, as part of a workup, it's detected. It's associated with coronary complex, though that is typically uncommon. How do we look at it? Well, location is also very important. It typically originates from the region of the fossa ovalis, and you can see it very nicely in this case. It's a polypoid mass with lobular margins. This is one of my favorite examples. It may contain focal calcification, hemorrhage, necrosis, or cyst formation. And calcification is the most common thing. A question always comes up, can you see calcification in a thrombus? And I guess anything could calcify, but it would need to be a really long-standing thrombus. If I see calcification, I'm really thinking myxoma, particularly when it looks like these punctate calcifications. Now with myxomas, it may have a broad base or a narrow base of attachment, so that specific finding is not that helpful. Uh, here was a great case I saw where I thought it, it was uh, a myxoma. Uh, I thought there was a stalk present. Um, again, in this case, could you call it a thrombus? It's kind of irregular. Uh, it's larger than the base itself, but I really thought this was a myxoma, and in fact, it was at surgery. Now, we can see other uh, tumors, lipomas. It's a benign neoplasm composed of mature adipose tissue, can occur solitary or multiple. Now, with lipomas, sometimes they're purely fat, and it makes it very easy to make the diagnosis. Other times, they're simply hypodense with a low CT attenuation of maybe 10 or 20 Hounsfield units. So it's not always that minus 50 or minus 80 fat measurement. Uh, lack of mobility, broad base of attachments, lipomas are indeed pretty rare. What about primary malignant tumors? Well, that's rare. It's less than 25% of all primary tumors. Angiosarcoma is the most common primary malignant neoplasm. There are also other sarcomas with different mesenchymal differentiation, but again, it's kind of a spectrum of findings. Angiosarcoma is number one. In terms of CT features, and we'll look at these in individual cases, but large irregular hypodense intercavitary lesion, 
or it can be infiltration along the myocardium, the pericardium, valves, and great vessels. So the thing about primary tumors of the heart, they're very much often infiltrative. And so when you see something infiltrating, you got to be thinking about that. Again, lymphoma with direct extension, lung cancer with direct extension can cause similar findings, but usually um, those go along the great vessels or the pulmonary arteries, for example, or pulmonary veins. So sometimes there is some helpful findings there. Now, if we look at angiosarcoma, it's usually a middle-aged patient, more common in men than women, and typically arises from the right atrium and pericardium. So I've seen, the cases I've seen, particularly early, are always coming off the, uh, let's say, about 11 o'clock on the heart. They can arise from the pulmonary artery as well, but that's pretty rare. Clinical presentation is variable. You can have valvular obstruction. You can have right-sided heart failure. You can have pericardial tamponade with hemorrhagic fluid. Uh, these lesions will spread metastatic disease in up to about 89% of cases, can involve lungs and liver, can go to brain, skin, and bone. And let's look at some examples. Here's a great case of an angiosarcoma. Now, this patient we scanned a number of different times, but you can see it's an infiltrating process. You're really not defining it discreetly on any one image. It's low density, but not like fat. It's hypodense like a typical tumor. Could this be metastasis? Could this have been a lung cancer spreading in? I guess it could have been, but in this case, it's a hypodense mass, right atrium, origin with extension into the right ventricle and SVC. The primary sarcomas really are infiltrating in nature. Now, beyond angiosarcomas, we mentioned undifferentiated sarcomas. It's the second most frequent primary cardiac sarcoma. It's a wide age range with diverse clinical presentations. But again, uh, in terms of location, these are a bit different. Left atrium rather than uh, the patient's right atrium. Imaging features include polypoid masses, infiltration of the myocardium, and a tendency to involve the cardiac valves. And here's just a nice example. This is a 42-year-old woman with a regular hypodense polypoid mass, you can see very nicely, which arose in the left atrium. You could see how it grew out. It encased the left pulmonary vein and nearly occluded the left pulmonary vein, the circumferential uh, encasement of the left circumflex coronary artery. Uh, you can see tumor infiltration of the pericardium, so it is indeed very extensive. What else? Intracavitary cardiac metastasis. Um, can be hematogenous metastasis extending via the coronary arteries. Implantation of cancer fragments can be carried through the uh, IVC or even SVC. The most common primary neoplasms metastasizing are melanoma and sarcomas, and they can involve any cardiac chamber. They're often multiple well-defined masses, and they can involve the myocardium as well. Usually it's accompanied by evidence of hematogenous metastasis to other organs, so the diagnosis tends to be a bit easier. For example, melanoma, typically not going to see melanoma only of the heart. You'll see it to the adrenal glands or kidneys or soft tissue nodules. And here's just a very nice example. This was a malignant fibrocysteocytoma. Metastasis infiltrated and extended from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Again, very, very hard to see any clear planes. Here's a patient with an adenoid cystic carcinoma with focal metastasis to the right atrium and right ventricle. A very unusual case, but you can see they're discrete masses. And when you talk about multiple masses, you got to be thinking about metastatic disease. And again, you really see these very nicely on the fast scanning because there's no motion on these images. And here's another example of metastatic melanoma with right ventricular involvement. Also, uh, the patient had uh, atrial involvement as well. Now, when we speak about direct extension, um, it can occur from lung cancer or other mediastinal neoplasms. It's most common in bronchogenic carcinoma, but can occur in mesothelioma, in thymic carcinoma, esophageal cancer, breast cancer, and lymphoma. So almost anything that has direct extension. And here's just a nice example of a patient with lung cancer. Um, and you can see there's really this infiltration along the right hilum. It's basically hepatitization of the lungs, which is now growing into the heart, growing into and involving the left atrium. You can see this example, a patient with metastatic sarcoma of the thigh. Look at the extension uh, growing into the patient's left atrium, direct invasion through the posterior wall, very extensive lung metastasis as well.
We also can see spread along the patient's pulmonary veins, and here's just a very nice example. Uh, primary lung malignancy can extend along the pulmonary veins and infiltrate the heart. Again, the left atrium is the most common area of involvement in this scenario, and you can see a very nice example here. Uh, primary lung malignancies, particularly pulmonary veins, is a very good pathway. As I mentioned, left atrium, and here's just a very nice example. Very, very extensive tumor. Uh, again, we often see lung cancer involve the mediastinum. It's a lot less frequent to see it involve the heart directly, but it does occur, particularly in patients uh, these days, as I said, with chemotherapy, where we're changing the basic response of the patient's tumor. And again, uh, lung metastasis can also uh, extend along the pulmonary veins and invade the heart. Here's just a nice example. Metastatic chondrosarcoma grows along the right superior pulmonary vein and extends into the left atrium. Very nice coronal 3D imaging. And here's a nice example of melanoma. In fact, this patient presented with a right lung mass, and when we evaluated it, we could see the tumor growing straight into the heart. This patient had melanoma 20 years earlier. Now, what else? We can see extension along the SVC. Um, we think about lung cancer, we think about thymoma, and in that scenario, of course, right atrium is most commonly affected. And here's just a nice example of right atrium with tumor extension. Again, thymoma is one of the classic things. This was an example of small cell. We look for SVC obstruction, which this patient has. You can see the collaterals in the chest wall. So very common to see SVC obstruction as well as extension. So those two are very nicely seen together. We also speak about and have spoken about in other lectures, extension of tumor up the IVC into the patient's right atrium. We talk about renal carcinoma, hepatoma, and adrenal carcinoma. Those are the big three, and right atrium is typically involved. In this case, particularly with hypervascular renal cell carcinomas, the hypervascular thrombus extending into the right atrium is very nicely defined. Now, the last thing we'll talk about is pericardial masses. When you talk about pericardial masses, you're talking about primary malignancies as angiosarcomas. We spoke about that a moment ago. We talk about metastatic disease. We talk about some benign processes, pericardial cysts, pericardial calcification might be two of them. And here's just a nice example of implants on the pericardium from a primary cardiac malignancy. This patient had undifferentiated sarcoma, began in the left atrium, this tumor spread, and now there's multiple enhancing pericardial implants. Or in this example, hematogenous and lymphatic spread often late in the disease process, particularly with lung and breast and lymphoma. Here you can see pleural implants. Here you can see tumor extension. You can see pericardial effusion, which in this case was malignant. So again, pericardial metastasis, the most common sign, is pericardial effusion. Uh, pericardial thickening also occurs often with enhancement. When you see lobulations to pericardial fluid or to the pericardium, you have to suspect tumor infiltration. Now, what else can we see? Well, pericardial cysts, typically the water density, usually right cardiophrenic angle, incidental findings, they do not cause symptoms, they can be large, and occasionally, as in the case on the right, they can calcify. Now, we also rarely can see vascular masses. We've picked these up incidentally in some of our cardiac CT patients where we're looking at the coronary arteries. Fibroelastoma is the one you typically think about. Sarcomas are rare. And vegetations, particularly in patients who have endocarditis, are things to look at. Here's a nice example of a fibroelastoma. It's the most common tumor of the heart valves. Patients are typically over age 50. Uh, aortic and mitral valves are most commonly involved, and it's a small mobile mass attached to the valve by a short pedicle. So just a very nice example. And unless you gate the study, you're just never going to see these small lesions. So hopefully I've covered with you some of the key factors in the heart. Primary cardiac tumors are rare. Metastases are more common than primary tumors, but both of them are rare, though we're seeing them more frequently. When you analyze them, your approach should be based on a differential diagnosis, thinking about location and extent of involvement, specific CT characteristics, and clinical history, particularly other primary tumors. We referenced a number of key articles, and hopefully you found this talk helpful. And with that, I wish you a great day.